Robin Hood Radio presents Stage Right or Not with Michelle Willems. Michelle is a longtime journalist and herself is a published playwright of several theatrical works. She's a frequent contributor to the Huffington Post, Daily Beast, and the Atlantic websites. I returned to New York this past week and saw five shows, all off-Broadway, where much of the action takes place while the big fall productions, and there are plenty of them, get ready for their official openings. So, how to sum up what I saw? Well, one is bloody and intense. One is a musical montage of the lives of young Manhattanites. Another is a tribute to one of the great music men in history, Yet another deals with those who tested the food of the Fuhrer to be sure no one was poisoning him. And one play questions where spies go when a war is over. Well, let's start with that war, which figures in two of the shows. Hitler's Tasters, playing at a tiny upstairs venue in the West Village, may have been the most surprising of my week. This production by the New Light Theater Projects is female-driven, The writer is Michelle Colos Brooks, the director Sarah Norris, and four talented young actresses portray girls whose job, or as they call it, whose honor, is sampling three meals a day before they are served to Hitler. There is nice humor in the show. The Fuhrer is coming to eat with us, claims one girl excitedly. You mean he's coming to watch us eat, comes the reply. I'm sure Hitler would never force himself on me, says one. I'm not Poland. And there is some actual suspense in this short piece. What didn't work for me was including contemporary references like selfies, yoga, and sentiments like, he's hot and this sucks. Now, there was clearly thought behind that decision, but frankly, it seemed unnecessary and ultimately confusing. Still, this is a show worth tasting. The Second World War is also the setting, or at least the focus, of Mother Night, based on a book by Kurt Vonnegut and playing at 59 East 59 theaters. Now, there is a reason so few iconic books are adapted, or adapted well, to the stage. I think of Act One, 1984, and now this one. The production, written and directed by Brian Katz and featuring seven performers in multiple roles, never really lifts off. Even though we hear about double agents, propaganda, war crimes, and once again, the man here referred to as the beloved Fuhrer. But there is far too much narration, down to details like, I opened the letter, and we are watching him open the letter. Over-narrated theater rarely works. It's just too difficult to get a dramatic flow going. Yet, anything that reminds us that anti-Semitism and racism can rise again, well, is worth something. I wish I could say this one was worth seeing. Meanwhile, over at Theater Row, the Keen Company is presenting Ordinary Days featuring talented performers playing a quartet of types, we have the pretty, somewhat chilly blonde with a secretly, a secret finally revealed, and her patient boyfriend. There's the sweet, nerdy guy and the brass, cynical young woman who responds to his offer of coffee with, you're gay, right? I'll give you 20 minutes. There's nothing really new in the storytelling about the city that never sleeps, aside from the fact that it's completely sung through. And the singing voices are all superb, by the way. The songs by Adam Guan show real promise, and Jonathan Silverstein's direction is simple and well-paced. Ordinary Days is an easy enough way to make yours seem a little less so. Now, the other two shows I saw are back at 59 is 59. Good Body by J.C. Ernst frankly creeped me out, though I must say there was laughter and appreciation from some of the audience. The story centers on a dead body discovered in an old barn with a woman who has a gun in her hand who can't imagine she would ever shoot off a man's face. Those are her words, not mine. Two other characters appear, and the actors are actually superb in what is a difficult piece. Still, if you don't like loud noises, steer clear. If you don't like blood, steer clear. If you don't like four-letter words coming at you constantly or non-stop claustrophobic intensity, steer clear. Otherwise, you may find absurd humor in this one. As for me, I couldn't wait to get out. So let's end on a happier and less violent 
Hershey Felder's Irving Berlin, which is continuing a run in the largest venue at 59 East. Now, despite the fact that the New York Times wrote an unnecessarily cruel critique, dare I call it a fake review, Felder's loyal fans have filled the house almost every night. I found this a lovely and almost important show if you have any interest in the art of songwriting, not to mention the story of true patriotism, this being about a poor immigrant Jew, one who went on to join our army and write White Christmas, God Bless America, What'll I Do, Counting My Blessings, Alexander's Ragtime Band, Always, and hundreds more. The intermissionless piece is a double love story, really, between a man and his new country and between a man and a woman who was basically disinherited by her wealthy father when she dared to marry what he called a singing waiter. And one 15 years older than her, by the way. Well, the marriage lasted 61 years and she, in fact, died first. Berlin may have loved and served his country, but he also saw its weaknesses. He bravely put Ethel Waters in a show, even when the rest of the cast said they would not stand and take a bow with a black woman. He wrote for another Ethel, as in Merman, who he says was not like writing for a human being. Out of that merger came a little ditty called There's No Business Like Show Business. So, quite a week of show business for me. Yes, off-Broadway, but that's where folks are typically trying to offer something different and more thought-provoking than what you often get on the big stages. Though, it seems Broadway itself has some meaty material coming in the next few months, in contrast to last season's boring, short-lived, and tired fair. This includes, by the way, the ultimate challenge for adapting a beloved book to the stage, that being To Kill a Mockingbird. So, Jill, stay tuned. Oh, we've been waiting for To Kill a Mockingbird for quite some time, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, it's finally starting previews uh, in so November. We will definitely see how that one goes. What I'm curious about is uh, the meaty fair. Yeah. When it moves to, I mean, and, and, and we've, we've, we've talked consistently about how um, off-Broadway is absolutely uh, the, uh, you know, the, a, a good place to start things out. How yeah. does it do entertainment-wise? Uh, on Broadway, Broadway, typically. Uh, how does what do? How does Meteor oh, Gritty fair do on Broadway? Very yeah. good. Well, we'll find out. We've got Fairy <clears throat> Man Coming, which is a three-hour piece by Jez Butterworth. We have American Son, which stars Kerry Washington, but it's a tough piece about a, a black man possibly unfairly imprisoned. Um, we have Lifespan of a Fat, as a starry trio of actors, on the other hand, it's sitting around talking about whether to print a particular piece in a paper. We have Waverly Gallery by Kenneth Lonergan, which is a revival. But uh, how they will do, we will see. I think this is a pretty good package of, of, of shows coming, either because they have big names behind them or big names on stage. Um we will see. Um, you know, uh, that's why I like going by that half price ticket booth once things open to see how they're doing. You know, reviews matter. Uh, not in the case of Hershey Felder, obviously. But right, because, and, and this is something people should be aware of. Reviews are, um, you know, not, not. Well, how many times have you gone to see something just as a regular person that yeah. you read a review of and ended up really liking? Well, absolutely. And I have to say, I mean, again, I don't want to labor the Irving Berlin show but I must say when you read that vicious review about everything people are in watching the show and they're saying what was that critic talking about did he see this show or what did he, you know so uh, I would say uh, maybe half the time you come in and think, usually it's the other way around frankly that something has been raved about and you come in and you think huh yeah Oh, what what's so great, you know? But sometimes they're in love with a particular writer, or but but know. the point the point being that it cuts both ways, and that you actually both. have to uh, understand, especially. And this is getting you know this is pretty prevalent, and it's just getting worse. The great thing about live theater yeah. is it really is seeing and believing. Right. In other words, you're not you're you're not uh, subject to anybody's manipulation or editing or whatever, uh, right. which pretty much all video you, you know now that you can fake anything, 
literally. Right. You know, video, it, it, it's not even well to just see it. You know, any, anything end screened, my word, can be faked. That's right. And, uh, you know, I know people who don't go to play. A, they either don't read reviews or they try to see the plays before they open. Now, uh, they don't like press to do that, as I've said to you before. So people like me aren't really allowed to do that because theoretically they're still working on that play until it's locked in at the very last moment. So, you know, you might be seeing something that's not at its finished uh, place. But there are others who just want to experience things that they don't know from previews. You know, people who come from out of town, uh, they get a play. They don't know. Most people are not that savvy, or maybe they shouldn't be. They just want to see something that sounds good. Traditionally, dramas like this heavy stuff coming, traditionally dramas don't do as well as musicals. We know that. And that's why this is a very unusual fall season with about six six non-musicals opening. I mean, last fall, I think there was one, and it was terrible, The Parisian Wife or whatever that was. So this is unusual, and people are talking about it. And, uh, and we'll see yeah. what happens. And from a musical standpoint, from a lighter fare standpoint, what, tell me what you're looking forward to other than the replacement uh, of My Fair Lady, which happens very shortly. It does happen shortly, and I'm going to go see it with Laura Bonanti. Um, well, I have to say all these dramas I'm looking forward to. I'm trying to think what the next music, the, the other big musicals I don't think are, well, you know, there are a lot of these jukeboxes opening. There's one called Prom. There's Cher is opening. I, I can't say I'm looking forward to those. Um, Kiss Me Kate, I believe, is coming in the spring with Kelly O'Hara. Well, how do you not look forward to that? I don't know. So far, it looks like it's going to be an interesting, a really interesting testing season on Broadway. Will people come out for heavier fare? Stage Right or Not with Michelle Willens, produced in the studios of Robin Hood Radio, robinhoodradio.com.